As Matt said, my name is uh, Rafi Shlomi. Um, I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. Uh, and I am uh, one of the authors of the AMQP specification uh, and an editor in the, uh, the TC at Oasis. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about messaging in general and what AMQP uh, offers um, and sort of a, a little bit of its history, how it came to be, um, and then go into, um, go into what uh, Proton is doing in the Apache Cupid project uh, for making it really easy to integrate with and work with AMQP and build distributed systems based on this, uh, this uh, standard. And then at the end, I'm going to do a little demo um, about, my, well, OK. Assuming the Wi-Fi holds up, I'm going to do a little demo uh, about integrating different, uh, different uh, apps or parts of an app together uh, in the cloud. So, um, so AMQP is uh, it's an Oasis standard, for those of you who don't know. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a standard messaging protocol. Um, and, uh, and Proton is a toolkit for speaking AMQP, which includes two parts, the, the uh, protocol engine um, and the messenger API. I'm going to get a little bit more into that later on. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about messaging. Um, so messaging really is something that inevitably comes out of the, the uh, process of building distributed systems. Um, and if you've ever built a distributed system, you know that sort of tightly coupled distributed systems can be very, very uh, brittle, right? If you've got a storefront and a warehouse and your warehouse goes down and it's tightly coupled to the storefront, suddenly you can't, you can't take any orders anymore because your warehouse is down. Um, and that's bad. So uh, sort of the natural progression from that point is to introduce an order queue in between um, and create a more loosely coupled system. Uh, and in this more loosely coupled system, if your warehouse goes down, the order queue can take up the slack while you have time to recover. I mean, it, it probably can't last, you probably can't last indefinitely in that state, but at least you don't experience an outage and you have time to recover. And if you provision your queues, you know, your order queue well enough, then you can uh, recover and no one will notice uh, the back, or uh, that, that, that your back end has gone down. Um, so, uh, in addition to being more robust, you know, systems that are more loosely coupled are more flexible, right? So instead of these sort of, and, you know, directly tied together things, you have sort of more, more uh, abstract communication patterns. You can have end warehouses on the back end and storefronts. You can, you can, uh, put queues in between and, and um, you can sort of scale out um, and have more flexible uh, topologies. So messaging really comes out of formalizing concepts like these. Um, and you know, instead of an order queue, you have a message queue, right? Uh, and a couple key things about messages. Um, messages are not, they're not entirely opaque. Some properties are available for semantic routing for messaging infrastructure. And in general, uh, the way addressing works uh, in these messaging systems uh, is that addresses are rendezvous points. So it's not, it's not really like um, TCP addressing or, or like, well, like IP addressing, uh, where you know, the, the endpoints are what you're actually uh, naming when you, when you type out an IP address, right? Um, it's more like you're saying, I want to send a message to this rendezvous point, and then someone else is saying, I want to receive messages that are sent to that rendezvous point. And so you have a brokering, right? You don't, you don't have senders and receivers necessarily directly aware of each other. And with this idea, you can have a couple of different, you know, you can have different uh, semantics for, for routing messages and different, different communication patterns. So, um, you know, the uh, sort of a, a message queue, which is um, just sort of a more abstract form of that order queue, right? Uh, you can have many producers that 
that flow messages into it, and then messages get distributed to one and only one consumer, and that's queuing semantics. Um, topics are another common uh, abstraction, and for topics, messages sort of, they flow into the topic, and then they flow to each producer, or sorry, each subscriber. Um, so each, every subscriber gets every message. So it's kind of like, you know, your, all your subscribers are logged into a chat room. Everyone sees everything that's said. Um, uh, and, be, you know, because the messages have properties that are visible to the, to the, the infrastructure, you can actually configure um, routing based on those topics. So uh, what you see here is a filter. Ooh, can you see the pointer? Ah, yes. Uh, what you see here is a, a filter that doesn't allow red messages through. And as you can see on the fancy animation there, uh, the, the bottom little circle doesn't see any red messages. So that's the basics sort of of, of you know, the messaging. Uh, and it's a really powerful and flexible tool for building distributed systems. And distributed systems, by their very nature, uh, tend to be um, heterogeneous, whether you want them to or not. They sort of grow extra limbs. Um, and uh, so, you know, an actual picture might look something more like this, where you have, you know, different, different clients and different platforms, um, you know, and, and you don't have just sort of the, the messages flowing in one direction. You have messages traveling around in circles and whatnot. Um, going back and forth, and uh, it, it sort of quickly becomes integrated into every aspect of, of, your, uh, of your business. Um, so uh, the problem is when you take a picture like this and you build your, your uh, business on top of you know, a proprietary messaging infrastructure, uh, you are now sort of tightly integrated into this proprietary uh, messaging software. And if it's speaking a, uh, a uh, vendor-specific protocol on the wire, then the only way to actually communicate with your messaging infrastructure is to actually integrate little pieces of proprietary code into your uh, application. And this pretty quickly becomes pervasive. And soon, you know, Every aspect of your business has some proprietary piece of code running into uh, running in it, and it um, uh, if if you you know if like your vendor doesn't have uh, a a client available on on some given platform, you might just be out of luck. So this little blue square in the corner, um, he might not be able to tie into your proprietary uh, message bus. So this is the, this is the, the uh, th this problem actually gets even worse if you say uh, have two proprietary messaging uh, systems, right? Maybe maybe your business acquires another business, and you know what do you do? You can't port the other the other uh, applications because it, you know, y y it's a lot of work to rewrite it all to a different API, um, and integrating is kind of difficult as well. Because uh, you know they don't usually speak to each other, so you need to do application level bridging and translation of message formats. Um, so it, it gets even worse with, when you have uh, when you have multiple proprietary uh, systems involved. Um, so this is kind of the world in which AMQP was born into, um, and it, it started about what, what is it like five or six years ago um, inside JPMC, uh, the brainchild of John O'Hara, um, and uh, he, f f uh, he and a bunch of other companies started the AMQP working group, and uh, uh, it was originally just an industry working group, and after developing um, uh, the protocol for a number of years, uh, actually it was in just October, this, this past October, uh, that we voted through, or we, well, actually last year we went to Oasis, and then this October, we voted uh, through the 1.0 version of the standard. 
Um, and just one thing I'd like to call out about this slide is you can see Microsoft, Red Hat, and VMware um, are all involved in this group. And when the, those three companies get in a room and agree on something, uh, you can tell that there's uh, some, some strong motivation behind it. Um, so uh, actually, interestingly enough, the, the world has changed a lot since AMQP was first, uh, was first conceived of. Um, and uh, initially, the idea was, well, you know, create sort of a standard interface to a message broker. Um, but uh, since, since it was sort of originally conceived of, the you know, mobile networks, mobile technology has just exploded. Um, and as we've developed the protocol over the years, we've actually considered this and uh, really tried to, to express core messaging semantics in a way that, that are applicable uh, beyond just sort of traditional message brokers. Um, so uh, AMQP 1.0 really, it, it really captures uh, the, these, these core messaging semantics that, that any, any message-oriented application uh, is going to encounter, pretty much any distributed application, um, and is particularly well-suited uh, for sort of store-and-forward uh, you know, style asynchronous interactions that, that work well uh, in, um, in mobile networks. So to take a look at our picture again, uh, with AMQP in the picture, uh, we now, instead of uh, having a, um, instead of having a uh, proprietary piece embedded in our apps, we actually embed, embed an open, um, an open uh, protocol implementation in our, uh, in our proprietary infrastructure. And now all of our apps can speak just standard AMQP over the wire. And if, you know, even if the vendor doesn't support, you know, our whatever platform our poor little blue square is running on, um, you can always find you know, some free implementation somewhere and get access to your messaging infrastructure from, from wherever. Um, but that's not all, actually. Uh, you can, in fact, have heterogeneous infrastructure now. Um, you don't need to pick, you know, topics from and queues from the same vendor. You can pick, you know, topics from one vendor, queues from another, right? Or you can pick, you know, one kind of queue uh, that's 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 very, you know, specially suited for your particular application. Um, so it really enables a much more diverse uh, way of deploying uh, messaging applications. Um, and on top of that. Uh, because it's a standard and secure uh, protocol, we can actually create open deployments as well, you know, run AMQP over the internet, and this is where you get the idea of the AMQP cloud. And, you know, that's, at, at this point, it's not just about using AMQP to, you know, talk to message queues. You can use AMQP to talk to anything. Um, so the, uh, the state of the world right now with respect to implementations, uh, there are actually a bunch of implementations out there uh, already. Um, and these, these are all sort of traditional broker type implementations. You've got uh, Apache Cupid offers a C++ and Java broker. Um, ActiveMQ, the latest one, I think is 5.8, um, is a... Uh, um, it now speaks AMQP 1.0. Uh, Microsoft Office offers an AMQP front end to uh, Service Bus, which is a platform as a service offering um, of uh, message queuing. Uh, SwiftMQ has a JMS broker and, and client um, and that both speak AMQP. Uh, RabbitMQ offers uh, an AMQP 1.0 uh, adapter as well. Um, and of course, there's uh, Proton, which is uh, also an AMQP 1.0 implementation, but it's different from the rest of those. Uh, all of those implementations I just spoke of are providing, um, are providing messaging 
infrastructure, so queues, topics, and the like. Um, Proton is actually an implementation of just the protocol, right? It's really trying to be that little blue dot, right? It doesn't wanna, want to, uh, it, it, it just wants to uh, make it as easy as possible to speak MQP. It doesn't wanna be the thing that stores messages, the thing that, that does fancy routing or anything like that. Um, and this is something that, that uh, prior to MQP 1.0 hasn't really been possible because as far as I know, all previous attempts to standardize messaging were very sort of client server based, right? And um, whereas AMQP 1.0 sort of takes a, a, a departure from that approach by being entirely symmetric, very network oriented, decentralized. Um, and it, it does provide the intermediated messaging semantics. So it, it, it's, it has that, um, that, uh, that rendezvous concept, uh, but it doesn't restrict uh, us to the sort of the hub and spoke topology that, that traditional brokers tend to use. Um, so it's really, it, it, it's really what makes a protocol implementation like Proton possible. Um, so, uh, and one of the reasons Proton uh, is, is, is valuable and, and will, you know, we hope to sort of see the ecosystem is uh, sort of in the traditional mom world, you, you tend to get sort of um, very specialized application behaviors built into queues. Um, so, you, and, and, and this sort of conflates the, the application uh, logic with the store and forward infrastructure. Um, so you get things like last value queues, uh, ring queues, you, you get message transformation. I think I've even heard of, uh, of a, a sorted queue implementation actually um, used in one particular uh, business, uh, which is pretty much, you know, at that point it's, you know, you wonder why you aren't using a database um, and just speaking to it via AMQP. Um, so the idea is that many different things, not just topics and queues will, will benefit from speaking AMQP, uh, but every message oriented ap application needs to sort of factor in these, these these uh, uh, messaging semantics, right? Flow control, very key. Um, you know, if you keep pumping messages into a queue, right, eventually that's gonna fill up, right? Or if you keep, you know, pushing messages at an HTTP server, it's gonna get busy, right? And, you know, if you're, uh, if you're gonna, you know, you, you wouldn't ever, you know, type your credit card number into a web page and hit submit if you knew that that server was gonna come back to you with a server busy. Uh, error code, right? And so it's actually, flow control is part of building robust and, and reliable systems because you need a way to, to keep the capacity uh, at something the system was designed to handle um, and ha handle back pressure in the places where, where, um, where, it's, uh, where it's intended uh, to be handled. Um, so settlement, really, that's just all the different acknowledgement patterns, um, you know, at every, Every uh, sort of messaging system, you know, tends to support uh, a different style of, of of acknowledgement. You've got sort of fire and forget. You've got you've got just simple acting, um, and then you have sort of more uh, more complicated three-way acting. You've got locking semantics, where you know you get a, maybe a, you get a lock for the message, and then it gets you know it gets uh, timed out later on. And so settlement basically handles or it is really about handling, uh, very precisely handling the transfer of responsibility of a message from one party to another. Um, and it captures all the various ways that you can do that. Um, transactions, I mean, inevitably, your uh, distributed systems tend to run into these. The, 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 the tr tricky thing here is finding a way to uh, deal with them without making simple cases complicated. Um, and data binding, right? I mean, if you're sticking data into, you know, if you're, if you're taking structured data in Python and you wanna, you know, uh, process it in Ruby or something, right? The, the type systems don't quite match up. They're a little bit different. You need to, you need to deal with that in any kind of heterogeneous distributed system. Um, so, you know, these are all factors 
uh, if you're building any distributed system, but nobody really wants to implement every one of these things down to the wire, uh, and that's where, that's where Proton comes in. So the goal here, make it as easy as possible to speak AMQP, all right, which means uh, we need to be super embeddable. Minimal dependencies, we need to be embeddable in uh, different kinds of environments, so minimal threading assumptions. You know, you might be a client library, you might be a server, totally different threading and I.O. models, but we want uh, Proton to be usable from both. Um, multi-language, of course, um, and multi-platform, uh, obviously, because, I mean, that's the heterogeneous part of heterogeneous systems. So the way uh, the basic architecture is built around this idea of a protocol engine, um, which is something that, that captures the, the semantics of the protocol, but doesn't actually do the I.O. itself, uh, because the I.O. is going to be different depending on what kind of environment you're in. Um, so a protocol engine sort of, I'm, I'm first going to describe what it's not. Uh, it's not the uh, traditional RPC-like pattern. So in a traditional RPC pattern, you sort of have this, this call stack here where the app calls into the, uh, calls into the library, which you know, then encodes some data and writes it directly out into socket, and that's on the client side. And then on the server side, you, know, you read that data, you decode it, you dispatch, uh, and then you call into the app. So the call stack is completely different between the server and the client. Um, the I.O. model is very different, uh, and the threading model is usually very different. Um, so in the engine pattern, we take that call stack and sort of fold it, <laughs> if you can imagine that. So in this case, the application does the I.O., and the engine encapsulates the protocol state. So you invoke into the engine, and then you see, hey, is there output? And if there is output, you write it. Um, and on you know, the other side, you do a read, you pump that into the engine, and then uh, you see if there's anything to dispatch. Right? And so in this way, we can capture the, the protocol semantics in a, in a, pure, um, in a pure state machine. Um, and so we have sort of the top half and bottom half here where where the top, where it's your sort of two aspects of the interface to an engine. The top half is, is sort of your traditional protocol interface in a non-blocking form. Uh, it lets you do sort of the higher level things like create senders, receivers, send and receive message data, that kind of thing. The bottom half uh, is just a sort of a, a byte stream interface. So to, to sort of build this up from the other direction, um, you can imagine sort of a simple, uh, a simple echo server, right? Uh, and something that just reads bytes in and, and writes them back out directly to the, uh, to the same socket, right? So uh, it's, you know, one of the classic things you write when you're trying to debug a server or, you know, create like an, an, uh, an, an I.O. framework, right? And so, uh, when you write one of these things, inevitably, somewhere in there is, whether it's in a temporary variable, in a member variable, something like that, right, is a byte buffer. And if you were to put an abstract interface around this thing, uh, you would have something that's pretty much an interface to a circular buffer or a byte queue. And so that's the simplest possible engine. Just, it's just a circular buffer. It's a pure data structure. No dependencies on threading or I.O. We can augment that by adding a query interface, and we have something that's slightly more interesting than a circular buffer. Not terribly interesting. We can count how many bytes go through. Maybe we can inspect and you know, for frames, kind of like Wireshark does, but still not horribly interesting. Um, we, uh, we can make it slightly more interesting by turning it into a request response engine, which from the perspective of the I.O. portion of your application looks exactly like a circular buffer but the bytes that are coming out, we happen to transform them in some way, some predefined transform. Maybe we're you know, doing ROT13, maybe we're doing UTF encoding or something, I don't know. Um, so a little bit more interesting, but still you don't really have control outside of the library of, of what's actually uh, happening to your bytes. Um, so you take the, the, this one step further, you add a control interface on top of your query interface, and 
or in addition to your query interface. And now what comes out can be controlled. Uh, it's actually uh, uh, by, by uh, the, the thing using this library. Um, but it's still a basic request response uh, pattern. Um, so to generalize this a little bit more, uh, we say, okay, the bytes that come out are a function of the bytes in or the control interface. Um, and this is sort of a generalized engine for a server. Uh, but in fact, because, um, because the bytes that, that uh, are, can be controlled by, or the bytes can be spontaneously produced when you, when you uh, access the control interface, you can actually do a, a fully symmetric protocol here. This is a generalized endpoint. You could do, uh, you could do the client half of a request response as well because you know, client, the client half needs to be able to spontaneously produce bytes. Um, so the AMQP protocol engine takes this uh, uh, one step further. I mean, it's basically the same idea, but um, in addition, uh, but we basically take that and, and divide it. We, we take the control portion, the query control portion of the interface and split that out into something that's stateful. Um, and this sort of divides be between sort of the high level portion that inter acts with your app and the low-level portion that's, that's responsible for I.O. And it, it, <coughs> it allows you to track state across multiple connections as well. As in, you can, or multiple sequential connections, that is. Um, so that's the idea of an engine. Uh, the benefit is flexibility. Um, you can use the same protocol implementation in, in a, pretty much anywhere, in a, in a client. You can embed it in existing servers. Um, it's totally thread agnostic because this thing is, is basically a pure data structure. Um, and, and most importantly, it's very easy to swig, uh, which for those of you who don't know, swig is a simple, what, simple wrapper interface generator. Um, it means you can take a C library and produce bindings very easily in Python, Ruby, PHP, Perl. There's like 20 different, uh, different things it supports. Um, and, uh, and this lets you very quickly get access to a lot of different, or get your protocol implementation access to a lot of different environments. Um, so now we take a look at our picture again. Um, we now have uh, sort of a multi-platform, multilingual implementation of AMQP, and we can, uh, we can actually bootstrap and realize this, this picture of, of the AMQP cloud. Uh, with Proton everywhere. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the, the engine half of, of the story. Um, the easy way to use this is, is Messenger, which is a very high-level interface to this engine. Um, it's sort of your, your client half. And what you see right here is some um, example code. It's sort of the hello world. Uh, you create a messenger, you start it, you create a message, give it an address, give it a body, call put and send. And then, you know, you stop the messenger when you're done. Receiving, similar, you create a messenger, you subscribe, uh, you start the messenger, and you receive, uh, and you get a message into your, into your message that you've created, and then when you're done, processing you can stop although it's it's an infinite loop so you would never stop but <laughs> um, so a couple things to notice about this this interface is message oriented not connection oriented so it will create or recreate uh, and it will pull the minimal number of connections behind the scenes to do whatever you want uh, this simplifies failover a lot and it also means the topology of you know how your messaging infrastructure is is deployed is is invisible to your application uh, which can be quite handy uh, and the idea behind messenger is to be simple but not a toy so you know one example of this is you see the batch oriented interface um, which it can actually uh, achieve some some uh, good performance uh, good performance for um, for this style of client um, uh, and well, not only good for performance, it can also be very convenient. You can, you know, create a message and, and modify it or receive a message, modify and resend. 
Um, reliability, adding reliability is pretty easy. You just set your outgoing window here, um, and that means it'll track the status of outgoing messages, uh, and you can access that later. Um, and on the receiving side, similarly, you, you can uh, use accept to, to acknowledge messages. Um, so as I mentioned before, message, it's a mutable and reusable holder of content. Uh, this, this works well with the batch send, um, and, and it doesn't conflate the notion of a delivery and a message, all right? Um, so you can, you can uh, as, yeah, as I mentioned before, you can modify a received message and resend it. Um, it also supports automatic data binding from AMQP to native type. So you can stick a like a Python dictionary in as the body. It will come out in JMS as a map message. Um, or come out in Ruby as a hash. Um, oh, and it's decoupled because it basically is just a an authoring tool. It, it's it's a way to author a chunk of bytes, and you can use that chunk of bytes with Messenger. You can use that chunk of bytes with the engine itself. Um, so uh, let's see how am I doing on time. Um, I'm going to do a little demo now. Uh, and show you some actual code, uh, live code of this stuff working. So I'm going to first show how this demo is set up. Um, what I've got is a an ordered. This is kind of like what 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 I, you saw earlier in, in in the examples, but a little bit a little bit different. Um, so I've got a a messenger or I have an order database implemented in Python. Um, it's implemented with Messenger. Um, the database is actually just an in-memory dictionary, but um, it, it would be pretty easy to use SQLite or something if you wanted persistence. <laughs> and uh, this Messenger is actually listening for three feeds. Uh, it's, it's listening to an order queue, well, two order queues, one of which lives in Service Bus. Um, that's Microsoft's uh, platform as a service uh, offering um, of queuing. Um, the other sits in, uh, uh, actually, it's in an ActiveMQ uh, instance running on um, an EC2 machine. Um, I've got a couple of submit and update scripts written in Python and uh, an order tracking page, which is written in PHP. <coughs> so. Um, I'm actually going to show you the code for this first, so you'll have to bear with me, and I hope you can see this stuff. So this is the order database. Sir. Oop. All right. I hope this is big enough for you to see. So to give you an idea, this thing is, what, 64 lines of code, and that's counting the, uh, the obligatory license header. Um, so this is our order database right here, just a, a Python dictionary. We create, oh, shrink it. Oop. Is that better? Okay. So uh, we've got an order, our order database here. Create a messenger, start it, and subscribe to these three feeds, right? So this first long one is actually MQP over SSL, and it's talking to uh, my Proton West uh, queue, or my orders queue at my Proton West namespace inside of Service Bus. Uh, this is this other line here is talking to uh, ActiveMQ on my EC2 instance. Um, they're both feeding, they're both uh, order queues that are being funneled into this one messenger. Um, and this one right here, if you note that little twiddle there, actually is telling the messenger, J 
just bind locally and, and accept direct connections. Uh, and um, so I create two messages, uh, a message um, to process incoming messages and a reply so I can construct my replies. And then I have my ubiquitous infinite loop here. Um, and receive will just block until I have incoming messages. And then I can process my incoming messages. Um, get will fill the, the message with whatever is on the head of the incoming queue. Um, this prints it out for just for logging. Um, so I clear the reply message, pull out the order ID, and then just have a big ugly switch statement, uh, or well, Python's version of a, strip, of a switch statement, which is a big if, else if ladder. Um, and so you know, I, I check on the type. If it's a submission, I, I update the status depending and stick it in the, my database. If, if, uh, if it's an update, I'll update it based on the content of the body. And if it's, if it's a, a status request, I actually construct a reply and uh, send, uh, send the reply off to whatever was put in the reply to address. Um, and if the, I, I also support uh, query for just listing all of them, all of the orders in the database, um, which is mostly just for my debugging purposes. Um, so that's it. That's the that's the order processing side of things. Uh, submit has some random command line argument parsing. Oh, and one interesting thing submit does. Uh, is it, it's going to randomly choose a queue to send to. So I, I, I got this idea over the weekend when, uh, or well, actually, yeah, over the weekend when uh, I noticed, uh, or when Service Bus had its uh, global outage. And I was like, hmm, I was going to do a demo using that. <laughs> that, that, that. It would be unfortunate if that were to happen uh, in the middle. And so uh, this way, actually, it's it's, I've got redundant queues between my front end and back end, um, and I just had I just randomly pick one here to send it to, um, and you know create my message, send it. That's it. Right, update is pretty much the same thing, except the message is slightly different. So that's that's the code here. Uh, and I'm going to show you, Oop. sorry, I'm going to make sure it's still actually working. Oop. All right. So what you're seeing up here on the top right-hand corner is the actually the uh, it's just a log from that EC2 instance from the from the uh, order database, and we can go to the. So this is this is the web page here, uh, or the tracking page. So you can see that there are a couple of orders in there already. So I can submit a new one. Say I want, you know. 10 units of some random skew. The Wi-Fi here is a little bit slow, but you can see that it goes, this one went through, this one went through service bus, right? And you can see it came out the other end. Uh, and, you know, let's submit just a, a couple more, see if any of them go through uh, the other end. Still service plus. Maybe I shouldn't have used random. What's that? Yeah, well here, let me try. All right, so 
I'm just going to comment that out so that we force one to go through. EC2, or the, through ActiveMQ. There, we went through ActiveMQ. ActiveMQ actually comes back a little faster than Service Bus for some reason. Um, so we can go check our status. They're all pending. Uh, you know, click here, look at the, look at the details. Um, and let's, let's update this last one. Let's say it's uh, shipped, and the FedEx tracking number is, you know, five. That's a good tracking number. And we can see the status is now shipped. FedEx tracking number is five. And there you go. So that's um, so that's this picture. Um, it didn't take that long to throw together, and in in a uh, you know it, 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 you've got structured data passing between uh, between PHP and Python. You've got uh, you've you've got um, You've got uh, the, the front end and the back end talking through, you know, not only redundant queues, but two completely different uh, cloud providers. Um, and, uh, and it all took, I don't know, maybe a couple hours to put together. Um, so uh, the uh, I guess the takeaway is MQP is really uh, intended to make it easy to build these kinds of distributed systems. Um, and it's really taking this messaging thing, which sort of grew up in this sort of big, heavyweight, middleware-y, enterprise-y backend thing, uh, and bring it to the masses, right? And there's, there's uh, really a great synergy here with, with mobile, uh, with mobile uh, communication scenarios because this kind of store and forward um, asynchronous messaging uh, or communication pattern is just a perfect fit for, for mobile networks. Um, and Proton, the goal of Proton is really to make that happen on two fronts. Protocol engine that you can embed in whatever server you have that wants to speak in MQP. Doesn't need to be a, a queuing or messaging, traditional messaging thing. It could be anything. Um, and uh, the messenger API, which is you know, dirt simple way to sort of get, you know, dirt simple on ramp for the AMQP highway. Um, and so we think this kind of thing is going to be the basis of uh, next gen applications. Um, if you want to learn more, there's, uh, there's um, information up here, Proton website, uh, amqp.org. You can read more about all this stuff. Uh, and I guess I'll open up for questions. How many people are using Proton? Uh, how many people? Sorry, I, I don't know how many people are using it. Uh, projects, so ActiveMQ uses the Java implementation uh, to provide their 1.0 support. Um, I know uh, or the, the C++ broker uses the C implementation. Um, there's a couple of other uh, other things in sort of in the works that are that are other projects that are that are um, that are moving to it, uh, but don't currently use it. And so th that's what I know of. I know there's there's a bunch that there's a from what I've seen on the list, there's, there's a bunch of other people using it, but I, I don't know actually what projects they belong to. Yeah? It's natural types in that language. So in Python, you use a dictionary. And so the MQP type system supports 
uh, lists, maps, arrays. Um, it supports all the basic uh, primitive types, uh, or you know, strings, uh, symbols, uh, binary data, um, integers, floating point. It actually even has things like decimal, decimal 64, uh, decimal 128 in it, um, and uh, UUIDs as well, timestamps, right? So basically, you any it, it supports sufficient numbers of types that any language can map their type system into AMQP's type system. That part's easy. Uh, the, the part that's a little bit harder when you're implementing a data binding, um, which Proton's done for you, but uh, is mapping from AMQP types back out into the type system. So for example, if you're, and, and, and this, this becomes visible when you use it a little bit, because uh, even though you can say in C, you can stick like an unsigned 64-bit integer, and, and in, AMQP is actually preserving that type information. If it comes out in Python and you're just using the default mappings, uh, well, okay, okay. actually Python's a bad example because in Python you can subclass like the basic integer types. Uh, uh, and so you actually will get a number that, that is a subclass that so it actually preserves the type information in Python. Uh, but it will look to you like a, just a regular integer, right? Because Python doesn't have Java is a better example, right? So Java doesn't have unsigned integers, right? So if you want to stick uh, it into, you know, stick an unsigned integer in on like the C end of an app and, and have it come out in Java, um, you have a choice between having it come out as something that preserves the type information, right? So some kind of Java class, you know, wrapper, or you can have uh, the data binding basically massage it for you into and whatever whatever type will fit. So if it's like this a... This is what you were getting at when you said it could easily swig? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Cool. And so that's, that's, that's one of the trickier bits, but that, that's, all, uh, that's all in the implementation. Um, as, as a user, you just need to be aware that, okay, if you're talking between Java and C and your C application depends on unsigned type information being preserved, you're going to have to be careful there uh, because Java doesn't naturally represent those types. Um, but if you stick to sort of a, a basic interoperable set of types, uh, it just all works seamlessly. So there's a, well, that's a, that's a big question. There's a couple of answers to that. Um, so uh, the, I mean, one way is SSL. You can use client side and server side certs, right? And, and every AMQP connection you make can be protected with SSL. Um, if you want to do that, uh, let's, if you want to uh, use that from a mobile device, uh, we actually support, um, Actually, the, the, the Proton engine itself uh, embeds the OpenSSL protocol engine, so it, it can actually speak SSL. You don't have to do anything to get that. Um, and it, it'll actually support session resumption as well, so you don't need to pay the cost of the expensive SSL handshake on mobile devices. Um, so that's, that's one answer. Um, but ultimately, if you're building a federated network of... Uh, of you know, messaging intermediaries, um, the point-to-point -point SSL protection is really just protecting uh, at a lower layer than your app might necessarily want, right? And the way uh, you would probably do security if you're if in, in that kind of environment is, um, well, the ultimate answer is with message level signing. So there's, there's areas, MQP gives you areas where you can stick a message level signature um, that travels with the message through the network. So the message can actually flow through untrusted intermediaries, and when you get it, you can actually validate it, kind of like email, you know, PGP signatures, except, except you're probably going to want to actually use it. Um, <laughs> so that, that's sort of the low end and the high end, and there's sort of, there's uh, 
other answers in between. You can, you, you can um, actually, just last week I was at a, an offsite uh, at the Microsoft campus discussing sort of how to, to, well, or to map claims-based security into AMQP so that you can, uh, that you can use the, the things like OAuth uh, with AMQP the same way you use it with HTTP. Um, so they're, they're, and, and AMQP, the, the 1 0 standard actually supports uh, SASL. Um, so you can, any, anything that works with SASL, so Kerberos auth, uh, you know, plain, you know, MD5, all, those, all the standard SASL mechanisms uh, will work with AMQP as well. So th does that answer your question? All right. Any other questions? Sorry? What other areas of the, are the community looking for people to get involved? Well, um, ah, okay. So uh, he's asking what other areas is, are the community looking for people to be involved in? Um, sorry? Oh, uh, probably one of the big areas is bindings. So. We've designed this architecture to uh, be very amenable to, 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 you know, creating bindings in other languages. Uh, but in order to, in order to take sort of the basic raw API that that you get out of Swig and turn it into something that looks natural and, and normal in that language, there's a, a little bit of work you do to actually wrap it. Uh, you don't need to be a protocol expert to do it. You just need to have a little bit of familiarity with the language and and sort of know how things are typically done, what standard libraries there are, what standard types there are. You know, like mapping into, like I, I did the PHP one, and just figuring out, okay, yeah, I had never done PHP before, anything with PHP before I did that, and I, it took me a while just to figure out, okay, it, there doesn't seem to be a standard UUID type, whereas in Python there is a standard UUID type. So, you know, things like that, figuring out how to map those types into the language, that, that's something that, that there would definitely be um, a benefit from uh, from sort of a diverse range of contributors there, um, and also uh, JavaScript. So we have uh, sort of the basis for for uh, scripting language support is is the C implementation because that's kind of what you want for something that you're going to be using from Python. Uh, but we also have a pure Java implementation, and we plan a pure JavaScript implementation for getting inside the browser. Um, and so the pure Java implementations is is uh, is humming right along beside the C one. The JavaScript one uh, has not yet been started. Um, and so, well, okay, a little bit of work's been done, but it definitely needs more help uh, and more people sort of familiar with that with that. Uh, that kind of technology. So, 